for another hand of praise. A story is told of two men, one an atheist and the other a backslidden Christian. And they were walking through a field one day when they spotted an enraged bull. Instantly, they ran as fast as they could toward a nearby fence, hoping uh, to hop the fence and avoid the bull. However, the storming bull followed in hot pursuit, and it was soon apparent that they weren't going to make it. Terrified, the atheist shouted to the other, put up a prayer, John. We're in for it. Besides, you're supposed to be a Christian. John answered, I can't. I've never paid, prayed publicly in my life. He said, but you must, implored his atheist companion. He said, the bull is catching up to us. All right, gasped John. I'll say the only prayer I know, the one my father used to repeat at the table. Oh, Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. Amen. I hope that you're truly thankful. No matter what trouble comes your way, no matter what you're facing, what you're going through right now, I hope and I pray that you are truly thankful. Because true thanksgiving is not a holiday, it's a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. When you're truly thankful, nobody has to make you come to church. When you're truly thankful, nobody has to make you attend Bible study. When you're truly thankful, nobody has to make you pray. And we're truly thankful nobody has to teach you or make you love other people. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary's cross, he died in order that we could live. And the way we show that we're truly thankful, not just by showing up on Sunday. We're not, we don't just show we're truly thankful just by, by tithing or give a, a few dollars to help support the ministry. But it's what you do when you leave church. Amen? Because anybody can act like the Christian's by sitting up in here. But the true test is when you get out there. Amen. And everything is after you after that. Amen. And so as we turn our attention today to Luke chapter 9, a very familiar story. This is Jesus as he's going about his ministry. He's right there on the border of Samaria and Galilee. And right there at the border, he runs into 10 men. It's 10 men that approach him. Now, by this time, Jesus is an itinerant preacher. He's traveling through and from through the land at the time. And what he has done has been made known throughout the region. In other words, his reputation has preceded him. And they've heard about him and the healings and the miracles and the things he has been performing. And so here we have, we we have, again, 10 men. And these 10 men represent me and you in some way, shape, or form. Amen? All society can be deducted from saying, okay, we're like these 10 men in some way. Amen? And so the question I have for you based on this this text is, how do your actions say to God you're truly thankful? All right? Number one, do you properly utilize the privilege of prayer? Amen. Prayer is a privilege. Prayer is communication. Prayer is not you just laying out your laundry list of things you want from God. But prayer is also listening to God because prayer is a two way conversation. And if you do all the talking and do any listen, I can promise you your prayer is probably not going to be answered. Amen. Because, again, prayer is a two way conversation. Now, prayer is also a privilege. Well, who is it a privilege for? A prayer is a privilege of God's people. Because if you're not a God's people, then God doesn't have to honor your prayers. Amen? He can choose to based on what his will is and what he's trying to do in your life. But if you want your prayers answered every time, all you have to do is be obedient as a Christian. Amen? You cannot live your life on your terms and then expect God to answer your prayers. Because if your children don't do what they're told, do you reward them for bad behavior? They get the report card back. They got all F's. They fail every class. You don't take them out for ice cream. Not if you're a good parent. Amen. They don't act the fool and don't clean up and don't do what they're supposed to do. And they don't clean their room. And they say, hey, come on, I'm going to make your favorite dish. But they do nothing you tell them. Now, if you're not that kind of parent, why do you think God is that kind of parent? 
Because God is not going to reward our bad behavior. Amen. So in verse 11 of chapter 17, it said, while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him. All right. Now, here's what's interesting is that leper, if you had leprosy, you live in a leprosy, leper colony outside the city. All right. And so you have 10 men. Now, who are these 10 men? Well, nine of the 10 are Jews. One of the 10 is a Samaritan. Always pay attention and track the story and find out who the characters you're dealing with. Because if you don't understand who the characters are and who you're dealing with, you'll miss the true meaning of the story. Amen. It's not by accident as Jesus traveling along that these 10 men approached him. That's not by accident. All right. Now you have uh, Jews and you have uh, a person who is a Samaritan. You might say, OK, when you when you unpack the Bible, you look at God, how God looked at, at people groups in the Bible. He didn't look at people groups the way we look at people groups today. See, we 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 are, we categorize people by the pigmentation of skin. All right. You either black, white, Asian, Hispanic, the main four groups. And then there's others. But that's how most of society is characterized. But in biblical days, you were not characterized by that way. You were either Jew, a Samaritan or Gentile. Right. The Gentiles came first. All right. The word Gentile comes from the Greek word ethnos. We got English word ethnic. All right. And so to be a Gentile, when the Bible used the word Gentile, it, it means a couple of things. Number one, it means all other than Jew. All right. It also means the way it's used is someone who is outside the family of faith. It's used to, to describe someone who is unsaved. And who has no part in God's kingdom. And also means someone who's on their way to hell. That's how a Gentile is described. Right? It wasn't until Jesus uh, came along, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they created a race of people called Jews. In other words, they took a person named Abram, who was a Gentile, and they created a brand new race of people called Jews. Right? That, come, that take, start taking place in Genesis 12. And so then God created a nation. That nation is called Israel. All right. That nation was disobedient to God. So God allowed the nation to be split in two kingdoms. Right. The northern kingdom was Israel, retained the name Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. God did that to usher in Jesus Christ through the tribe of Judah. Right. Now, in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom was attacked by the Assyrians. Right. And totally destroy them. All right. And they drag them off into captivity, into Assyria. Now, what ended up happening because of that, there were some Jews who were left behind in the land. And so what what the Assyrians did is there are people they didn't want in Assyria. In the proper, in the course uh, land. And what they did when they captured people, because Jews were not the only people they captured. And what they would do is take those people they displaced and put them people in the land where the Jews had just vacated. What ended up happening is those people got together and began to have families and marry and have children. That's where the Samaritans come from. Right. So they are half Jew, half Gentile, or they were referred to as half breed. Right. Just like we do today when people are mixed race, uh, oftentimes our society looks down upon them as though you don't fit. Amen. But what you have to understand is that because God created all the races and all the diversity and God loved diversity and stop saying that God don't see color when he created all the color. He just don't distinguish between color the way me and you do. All right. He don't make that a judgment against human beings because of the pigmentation of skin. Now, what ended up happening because of this, and, and, and the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And one of the main reasons why the Samaritans hated the Jews is because the Jews walked around and act like they were better than everybody else. Even today, you'll find Jews 
who feel like they're better than everybody else. You know why? Because they were God's chosen people in the Old Testament. The problem with that statement is that God didn't choose them because they were some great people better than everybody else. They were just as heathen and sinful as everybody else. But God called them out and he chose them because God was going to do a new thing on this earth. And they were supposed to be uh, the body of Christ in the Old Testament because they failed miserably. And the old covenant didn't work. Then that's why there's a new covenant. And that's why Jesus Christ had to come. But Jesus Christ was already going to come because he knew anything led by man was going to be jacked up. Anything led, led by man, especially when man puts his religious stamp on it, he knows it's going to be tore up from the floor. Amen. In order that, that when on the, because God knew that one day he's going to have us all stand before him for judgment. And it'd be unfair of God to hold us accountable for this life if he never told us what the rules are. Amen. Are y'all with me today? But he has given us the rules. It's called the Bible. It's the basis of instruction before you leave earth, if you want an acronym. But the problem is God has given us the instruction, but we don't follow the instruction. Amen. Because most of us don't go Bible study. We know very little about the Bible. And when, when us pastors stand up and preaching, a lot of times, you get information for the first time because you don't study the Bible yourself. Now, you might not have the depth always, but what you should do, it should be anything new. If this is your first time hearing this story about the ten lepers, that means you ain't read the Bible. Or you haven't been Christian long enough to get to that point. You haven't got all the way to the chapter 17 of Luke. Amen. So you're very unfamiliar. To understand what leprosy was. Now, these, now you have the Samaritans. I told you the Samaritans. Well, let me tell you about leprosy. Leprosy was a contagious skin disease that often led to death, right? And when you had it, it was contagious and someone else can be contacted from it. Now, even though it wasn't the skin disease, the closest example we've had, a living example for the last three years, it was called COVID. Because you didn't catch COVID from other things. You caught COVID from people. In other words, you caught COVID from someone who's infected with the virus. If you was exposed to them long enough, you got COVID because you were ex exposed to that virus. All right. Now, if you were uh, in those days, came around a leper. If you touch them. There's a strong possibility that that skin disease would be transferred to you. As a result, they had a special place for lepers. Lepers had, were lived in what's called leper colonies. That means they live outside the city. It doesn't matter what Jew, Gentile, or Samaritan, they had a commonality because they were kicked out of their community. Could you imagine? You contacted leprosy, but you had children, you had a spouse. Well, you were no longer living there. If your children contacted leprosy, they didn't live with you anymore. Could you imagine? Your five-year-old. Had to go live in a leper colony. And you'd hope that they had baby for them and pamphlets and all that kind of stuff for them because they weren't living with you. Could you imagine you couldn't contact the leprosy you couldn't live with your boo anymore? Could you imagine? Love you. Peace out. I see if you ever get healed. But there was no guarantee that you ever were healed. So many lepers, from the time they contracted leprosy, they were away from their, they were ostracized from their family. Now, because you had to eat and because you had normal business like everybody else, when you come into a contact with someone who's not a leper, you have to announce yourself. Let me help you out. Here you go. Unclean, unclean, unclean. In other words, in the military, we were in basic training. The, the training instructor would come. They would say, make a hole. Because the training instructor is not going to weave between you. In other words, you make a hole, get out of his way. Because he's the authority, or she's the authority, because you have female trained instructors. Make a hole. That, when, you, when you say that, unclean, you say make a hole. If you ever want to go to the bank and it's crowded, all you're going to be a leper. You get front in line just like that. You go shopping, unclean, unclean, everybody scattered. That probably was the coolest thing about being a leper, because everybody got out your way. It's like walking around and saying, I stink, I stink, I don't smell good, get out of my way. You don't want, to, you, you don't want none of this. <laughs> you, want, you, you want none of this. You better back up, back truck up. That's what a leper was like. Now, 
Notice that, remember, the Jews and Samaritans, they hated each other. But these ten lepers lived together. So they put aside their religious differences. They, they put aside their racial differences. Even their political differences. Because they were all in the same boat. They all had the same problem. They all had the same issue. So at least with that, they got along. Amen. You would think it took a disease for people to get along. It should not take a disease for people to get along. It should not take a tragedy for people to get along. We got a funny country in the United States. We only seem to get along when there's a na national catastrophe. For people to get, we willing to put aside their differences and work together, God has to allow a flood. He has to allow an earthquake, a hurricane, tornadoes. Or 9-11. Planes hitting buildings. Because at that time before 9-11 was all stirred up, remember the issue was prayer in school. I don't know if you remember this. Prayer in school was the big issue. Guess what? After 9-11, everybody was praying in school again. You weren't being called on the carpet for praying in school at that time because of the national emergency. So let me ask you something. How many national emergencies God has to allow to get us to pray? How many national emergencies God has to allow to get us to work together and forget about skin color? Forget about social economic status and be willing to work together just because we're all part of God's creation. Amen. Sometimes we act as though God loves some of us more than he loves the others. Let me help you all out today. I don't care how saved you are. God doesn't love you anymore. He loves anybody else. God's love is unconditional, and he loves all of us. He loves us so much that he will not take our choice away from us. Think about that for a second. If you choose hell, God's still going to love you. If you choose heaven, he's going to love you. His love will not change just because you choose to reject it. Because he loves us so much, he is not going to allow what we do to hinder how he loves us. Now, one thing we won't do if we don't, we're not obedient, we won't ex experience that love. And the only way you're going to experience that love is you have to be in Christ. Amen? So here Jesus is going along, verse 11 again, on his way to Jerusalem. He was passing by, uh, between Samaria and Galilee. He, he entered a village, ten leprous men, who stood at a distance with them. This was the second time in the book of Luke that lepers were healed. The first time was in, in Luke 5, 12. So, Think about it. You got to understand how important this is. People got cured from, people who got sick from COVID and end up in the ER, end up in, not just the ER, in intensive care on life support. And then they recovered. They see life different. Why do they see life different? Because they know that if God didn't intervene, they were dead. Now, they might have given credit to the doctor. But you know the doctor didn't heal them. Only reason they was raised up because God did. But what do you do with that chance? What do you do with the opportunity? God don't give you second chances so you can do the same thing you did with the first chance. He don't give you third and fourth chances so you can do the same thing you did with the first chance. Amen. At some point, you and I got to hear this and got to get the message and say, wait a minute. God expects more than me than just going through the motion. Amen. And they raised their voices. Now, these leprosy men, these ten men, they knew Jesus was coming, and they raised their voices because they remember they had to keep a distance. Here are these ten men crying out for Jesus. Remember, I told you Jesus' reputation by this time had preceded him. So when he passed through, right on this border of Galilee and Samaria, and Strategically, these 10 men, probably not too far from where they live in their leper, leper colony. Here he is. He didn't say anything to them, but they called out to him. You, get the, you track the story? Because they know and they heard that he can fix this. Have y'all know? Have y'all heard that God can fix this? Do you act like he can fix it? Do you take him your problems? 
Do you cast all your cares and concerns upon him because he cares for you? Do you wait on the answer? Do you trust him for the answer? Are you obedient through that process? They raised their voices. They said, Jesus, master. That's interesting. There's really no other time in the Bible where someone other than, a, than, a, than one of the original disciples called the master. Have you ever read the account that in the scripture? Other people call him teacher. They would say Lord. They would call him teacher. Some of you might call him Lord in a generic sense. But he call, they call him master. Now, what's the difference between the Jesus being Jesus, Lord, or master? Well, it shouldn't be anything because there's something in the Torah. But when you say he's my master, that means he has a say-so in everything we do. All right. If, think about the time of slavery. You went to bed when the, you were told to go to bed. You ate whatever you were given. You dressed whatever the way the master wanted you to dress. And you labored all day. And you couldn't say a word about it or, or take the lashing. That's what a master does. But the problem with us is that we don't see Jesus that way. The problem with us is that we're too comfortable with Jesus because we call Jesus our BFF. So there's no reverence. So we think that he's just the best friend we ever had. And we realize that we don't reverence him. Because if we do, then we would understand the relationship between a servant and a master. Right? So they call him master. Then they said something else interesting. Uh, because when they call a master a person of high status, particularly in view of uh, a role in, in leadership, they said, have mercy on us. In other words, to show kindness or compassion towards someone in a desperate need. You couldn't get no more desperate than this. Amen. No, disciples addressed Jesus master while non-disciples addressed him as teacher. The second point that we find in this text from verse 14. Of how do you how do you actually say to God you're truly thankful? Number one again, do you properly utilize the privilege of prayer? Amen. Prayer is two-way communication between God and his people. Do you properly utilize it? The second point is this: are you eager to follow God's specific instruction? Have you ever had somebody contact you and say, Hey, what's your rep uh, recipe for that dish? What's your rep recipe for that dessert? Now, we, we, we're going to have Thanksgiving this coming week. So this is one of the times that people share rep, recipes, do they not? You may call someone for a recipe, right? So what about it? You say you're going to make a, a pound cake, and you say, you know, uh, and somebody give you their, their recipe to make the best pound cake you ever had. You don't have any flowers, so you're going to use cornmeal. You don't have no milk, so you're going to use water. Everything you're supposed to use, you, you substitute. And then you wonder why you got a mess at the end that nobody else is going to eat. Now, why are you complaining about the mess in your life? Because those are the recipe that you went by. Those are the ingredients you chose to use. You didn't use the ingredients that God wanted you to use. You keep substituting your own. Well, I don't need to read the Bible. I just read the horrible scopes in the newspaper. I don't need biblical preaching. I would just, use, I would just turn into uh, my, 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 my uh, strong encourager who just tells me what I want to hear. My prosperity preacher, I'll turn to him or her. Then what are you doing? Substituting an ingredient for, for proper spiritual growth. And there's no such thing as shortcuts. If you want to grow spiritually, you do not take shortcuts. If you're going to grow spiritually and you're going to say, I need to get in shape. You know, my shape is not what I wanted to be. I'm going to get in shape. Or you're going to go to gym once a year. You go to your fitness center twice a year and you're going to get in shape that way. Well, if you if that don't work in the physical world, why do you think that works in the spiritual world? Because some people only come to church and tune in when the mood hits them. They don't plan on obeying God. They just need some encouragement. They just want to feel good about themselves. And unfortunately, it don't work that way. Because it only works if you're all in. 
So again, the second point, are you eager to follow God's specific instruction? He gave them a specific instruction. Watch, look at verse 14. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. Wait a minute. This is an imperative. This is a command. This is a specific instruction they had to follow. He told them, go and show yourself to the priest. Now, what if they decide, I don't even like them priests? There's a faith healer near my house. I'm going to go see him. Or somebody else, then you would never get healed. Because in order to get this healing, you got to follow these instructions. All right? And the reason why you go show yourself to the priest, you got to understand underlying factors here. You got to track the text because it was the priest that was authorized in Leviticus 14.1 required the priest to declare a person free from leprosy. In other words, if you were healed of leprosy before you could lead a leper colony and return to your family. Now, remember, if you were in a leper, leper colony, you can go to the temple. That means you couldn't go worship. You couldn't hang out with your friends. Your family became whoever you met in that leper colony. This allowed you to be restored to your community. So when you went to the priest, the priest would examine you. And then the priest would bless you and allow you to return to society. All right? If that doesn't happen, then you still can't. Because even if you're cle cle uh, cleansed of the leprosy, you still have to go back to the priest and get an approval of good health. All right? This is why he, because Jesus is following. Remember, he said, I didn't come to erase the law. I came to fulfill it. And so now he's just having them follow what the law said in Leviticus. All right? And it says that, and they, they were going, or as they were going, they were cleansed. You got to get this. To cleanse from ritual contamination or impurity to purify, in this case, lepers. Now, he said, these men are crying out to him from a distance. He has pity on them because he knows their situation. He knows they got family. He knows their life is ostracized. He knows that what they're going through and emotional and spiritual turmoil that that takes you through. He gave one simple instruction. Notice that Jesus didn't handle everybody healed the same way. He'd wave his hand on some people. He spit on some mug with other people. Because he didn't ever want us to put him in a box and say he can only do it this way. And all he did was say, go. Now you got to get this. They turned and walked toward the priest location, which means they would have had to go to the temple. As they're walking along, they Everything started clearing up. All they did was follow. All they did was obey. And as they obeyed, the disease left. Start clearing. Could you imagine? You got all this leprosy on you, and as you're walking away, and your skin is turning normal all because you obeyed. Amen. The third point. How do your actions say to God you're truly thankful? When God answers, how do you respond? There's one thing about being in a situation. And there's one thing about being in a circumstance. And there's another thing about being delivered or blessed or healed is how you respond to that, what God did. We don't respond well when God delivers us, when God blesses us, because there's never any thanks. There's never any thanks. Watch this. It says that, Verse 15, now they walked away, and as they're walking away, there's 10 men, one turns back. Verse 15 said, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back. Why did he turn back? Glorifying God. In other words, true faith and worship involves praising, i.e. glorifying, and he did it with a loud voice. You might wonder why some people are louder than other people in church. And you might sit there with your dignified self and say, don't take all that. 
Well, maybe you ain't been through what they've been through that God brought them out of the reason why they shout the way they shout. And because you never forgot what God did, you keep shouting. And you don't care who's offended by you shouting because they didn't go through what you went through. Amen. So they don't know you back when your life was tore from the floor up and now that God has brought you to where you are. Amen. Because before then, nobody could put up with you. You couldn't even put up with yourself. You were unput up withable. And because God has really turned your life around, you're thankful because you say, boy, if you knew me then, boy, I'd have smacked fire from you just being mad at you back then. But now, instead of slapping you, I pray. Amen. Instead of getting mad, I praise because I've changed. And I didn't change me, God did. And because God did what he did, I glorify his name. Amen. I'm excited because what God did. Amen. I'm excited. He did something else. Verse 16 says, and he fell on his face at his feet. At that time, worship was total prostrate. That's that, that Greek word proskuno. It means to bow down, face down. Now, when we bow, we normally get on our knees. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just going to tell you how they did in the Bible. In the Bible, they just laid on their face. They just lay spread out like this. In the military, we used to call it spread eagle. I used to be a military cop, and you didn't want us to jack you up and have you spread out on the pavement. You got on your nice blue uniform, it doesn't matter. You did something wrong, you're going to get out on the pavement. And, we, and you spread out like this. That's called spread eagle. That's how they prayed. They prayed, prosperate, spread out before God. Amen? And it says, and he gave him thanks. He's shouting. He's praising. He's healed. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thank, he goes back. He says, I have to thank the one who did this. I have to show the one who did this that I'm grateful. I have to show the one who did this, who restored me to my family. He restored me to my friends. He restored me to my job. I got to say thank you. I got to tell him. I got to let him know. I can't just walk away. I got to let him know. I got to go back. And I got to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know when you're grateful? Because you keep coming to church. Because he commanded us that we attend corporate worship. And because he saved us and he delivered us, the reason why we keep coming back to church, because it's our way to say to God, it's not just worship. It's also saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me. When you're not grateful, guess what? Being inside the house of God doesn't matter to you anymore. Because you got too comfortable with being online. And not knocking online. Online has its purposes. and It has its reason. But you know what? Some of us like real sugar. And some of us like substitutes. <laughs> don't cook me no dessert and put some fake sugar in it. I don't mind sweetening my coffee, but don't put no fake sugar in my cake. You can keep that for yourself. Because if I'm going to indulge, I want the total sweetness. Amen? So if, when I want to indulge in Christ, I want the real deal. I don't want no substitute. Amen? I, I want the real deal. What's better than talking to someone on your cell phone? In person, face to face. Which do you prefer? People you love, you gotta, you, you do better. Because there's more meaning in face to face conversation than talking to somebody on the phone. See, you can be on the cell phone with somebody and they be lying through their teeth. You might not even know. They might be talking to you on the cell phone holding their nose. Because then you're a leper. But you don't know. Because you can't see them. You might not know all the other things they call me and saying. But when you are face to face, it tells the whole story. Doesn't it? Not? Because in the military, in communication, what they teach us is nonverbal cues. In other words, you and I say more by the expressions and things we do than by our voice. Because you can say, boy, I'm just so excited. Now, you say it on the phone, but you're walking down the house like this. 
I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And the person you're talking to think you probably really are excited. You hang up the phone and go back to crying. Because you weren't really excited. But it's something about being in person when you read people's expression, read people's face. You know what is genuine. You cannot tell me you love me, but when I'm around you, ain't no hugs. There's nothing that you express that says I love you. Because nothing about your actions say that. Amen? But I'm supposed to be convinced because you use the words. Well, if, if actions don't back up words, then actions don't mean anything. And then words don't mean anything because it's just empty rhetoric. Amen? But this man was for real. Out of the ten men, the, uh, you would have thought that the other nine would have came back because the other nine would have been raised in understanding who the Messiah would be. The other nine would have been raised following the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The other nine would have uh, grown up going to the synagogue, going to the temple at certain intervals. They would have understood all that. This Samaritan would not have gotten all of that. He got some of that, but not all of that. But why is the Samaritan the hero of the story? This would be a slap in the face to the Jews who had listened to this. Because what, what he is saying to them, y'all who should appreciate me don't. And those you despise do appreciate me. That's what he's telling them. Because he's using the Samaritan as a real life story. As an illustration about what true thanks is all about. See, they should be thankful because they were God's chosen people. But they're not. Because they don't live in a way that God is pleased with. Which brought about a lot of their turmoil throughout their life, Old as well as New Testament. It says, again, he said, and, he, and this man fell at his feet, fell at Jesus' feet. Again, a posture of worship. Giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Why do you think that Jesus is telling this story and he highlights? See, up until now, only because I told you ahead of time that it would be a Samaritan. Now, if you're reading this story for the first time and you're hearing this, or if you are present, and then he, you're told that it's a Samaritan. Take somebody who's despised today. A lot of, a lot of our Muslim folk are despised today. They might practice a religion you don't believe in because it's not biblical. But not all of them are murderers or thief or terrorists. But what thing we do is we treat them that way. Even if they have, have shown no inclination of that. And could you imagine being a Sikh, somebody of the Sikh religion? Do you realize that's not Muslim? That's not Islam. It's a totally different sect, totally different religion. But when you see people with the turban on their head and all that kind of stuff, then they get ostracized because of the fact that people believe they're Muslim. All right? Now, let's go back a little bit further in our history. You all remember when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor? If you were J Japanese and lived in the United States at that time, guess what happened to you? You were taken and put in a camp. Oh, you all don't read American history, do you? You were snatched out of your home that you were paying for. Your belongings, your bank account, your furniture, all that was taken away from you. And do you know that many of those people never got their stuff back? Oh, y'all don't know the history of the United States. All because of what happened with Japan dropping the bomb, uh, dropping the uh, bomb in Pearl Harbor, of course, the, well, how we ended that, we, the atomic bomb was dropped on them. In Nagasaki, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But the problem, we don't study American history. And how those Japanese were, people were treated. How were they treated? They were treated so bad. And the sad thing is, they were American citizens. Because they come from Japan. But they became American citizens. They were treated in a different way. <coughs> that, say it ain't so. 
So you would have known the friction and the tension that would have been between the Samaritan and the Jews. And the only thing that brought them together because they had a commonality of a disease that caused them to have to depend on each other. So here's this Samaritan. The Samaritan man turns back. The Samaritan man gave thanks. The Samaritan man understood Jesus was God and he placed his faith in him as saving Lord. Watch this, verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Now, he didn't say that for his benefit, and not like Jesus can't add. And then like he didn't remember, that was rhetorical. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. Because he, everywhere he went, his disciples went with him. And he always stopped and did teaching moments. This is one of those teaching moments. Because they were Jews, they would understand Samaritan. Even they would have grown up standing their distance away from Samaritan. And the fact that Jesus made the Samaritan the hero of the story tells you something about Jews and how God can use whoever he pleases. Amen? Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? You know what he's asking them? He says it in the next verse. Verse 18, was not one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? A foreigner. Someone who is outside the family of faith actually gives more thanks than somebody inside. Well, at least you thought they were inside, at least they did, because they weren't. They were just religious. Many a Samaritan who understood the significance of what the Lord had done for him. Here Jesus asked three rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question means the obvious answer is yes, and it could be no. But in this case, he says, were there not ten cleansed? That's yes. In other words, he's not trying to trip them up. He's just asking them a question. They don't really have to respond because the obvious answer is, yeah, there's ten. Then he says, but where are the other nine? That's obvious, too, because they didn't come back to give thanks. Then he says, was not found who returned to give the glory to God except this foreigner? See, that would have told the whole story. <clears throat> to a Jew, that would have been embarrassing to a Jew. That a Samaritan gave more praise to God than they supposed to, and they supposed to be God's people. So where are the other nine? So what was the difference between the ten men other than the fact that nine of them were Jews and one of them was a Samaritan? Well, number one. The Jews showed no gratitude while the Samaritan returned to give thanks. Number two, the Jews went on their lives, went on with their lives while the Samaritan won a closer walk with Jesus. The Jews were satisfied with only being physically healed while the Samaritan was also spiritually healed. Go back to verse 19. I, you might have missed it. What were the other nine men seeking and only seeking? What was the only thing they wanted from Jesus? To be healed from their leprosy. That was it. That's all they wanted. That's all they wanted. Because the Samaritans saw fit to go back and thank the one who had delivered them. He got something else that they didn't get. He got something else far greater than what they experienced. Watch, what, what did he get? Jesus said to him in verse 19, stand up and go your faith has made you well. That word, that, that Greek word there is the Greek word sozo. Sozo is where we get an English word salvation. All right? In other words, he says your faith has saved you. What he's saying is, not only did this man get physical healing, he got spiritual healing. Amen. The other nine only got physically healed. But you can rest assured they died from something else. That's all they got. But the problem is with people when they want from God is they never seek for eternity. They don't look at things for eternity-wise. Watch this. In response to divine healing, the Samaritan man did four things if you didn't catch it. The more he praised God, a proper response to salvation, a proper response to God's blessing, a proper response to Jesus taking the time out with someone who would be considered unworthy by society. The second thing, he shouted with a loud voice. He didn't care who heard him. 
He was not ashamed of every knowing, knowing that Jesus saved him. He shouted with a loud voice. The third thing he did, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. In other words, he bowed down and he worshiped him. And the fourth thing he did, he thanked him. He gave Jesus the proper due. He gave Jesus the proper respect and courtesy he deserved because of who he is and what he had done. The lack of gratitude by the other nine men was typical of a rejection of his ministry by the Jewish nation. Jesus alone had the power to cleanse the nation and make its ceremony clean. However, the nation did not respond to him properly. The nation accepted the things that Jesus could do, such as heal and feed them, but it did not want to accept him as a Messiah. However, those outside the nation, such as the Samaritan leper, a person doubly repulsive to the Jews, he responded properly. Whereas the other nine received God's word and believed for a time, they fell short of the ultimate healing, i.e. experiencing divine salvation. That's why you come to church. I realize some people come to church, they're going through divorce. I know some people come to church because they're facing some kind of uh, financial situation. They're going facing some type of uh, health situation. That, would, that drives some people to church. The only problem is, is that that may be what God used to drive you to church, it which didn't mean by you stay in church. Because the situation is only allowed so God can hear the message. Amen? I don't care what you're going through, how bad it is, how good it is. The only reason why you're facing it is because God allowed it. And there's a method, uh, God's method to the man that's in everything he does. And you got to always ask yourself, God, what are you up to in my life? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? Amen? Because it's not by accident you showed up here today to hear this particular message today. What are you going to do with it after you've heard it? Amen? Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because those who come to him must believe that he is God and the reward of those who deal and seek him. In other words, without faith in Jesus, let me make it plain. Without faith in Jesus Christ, the saving Lord, you cannot please God. And the only way God pleases himself, you got to be a saved vessel and God is working through you and he's pleasing himself through you. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. gives us three imperatives or three commands that enables us to always be thankful to God no matter what. No more he says rejoice always. Well, how can I rejoice in a bad situation? It don't depend on what perspective I'm looking at my situation. If I'm looking at it from God's perspective, then that tells me God must got something good coming my way. Because he's just not letting me go through this for any old reason. He has a plan. Is a purpose. And the only reason this is hitting me is God is trying to show me, trying to teach me. He's trying to do something amazing in my life. Without the situation, I would have never known. Amen. Think about these 10 men, especially the Samaritan men. If he had never contracted uh, leprosy, he would never been saved. Because he would have never sought out Jesus to be saved or be delivered from the leprosy. But he got more than he bargained for because he not only got delivered from leprosy, he got salvation, but that's eternal. Stop. Here's my point. Stop always seeking temporary blessing from God and start seeking permanent blessing from God. Amen. Seek permanent blessings for God instead of temporary relief from a temporary situation. Amen. He said, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Well, how do I do that? Well, you eat without ceasing, don't you? Does that mean you eat 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No. You eat at intervals when your body tells you you're hungry. And if you're greedy, you eat beyond that. Okay, let's go there. But normally you eat, because the reason why we eat, we say thanks and give thanks for our food, because we need the food that nourishes us with our bodies, and our bodies for Jesus' service. In other words, the reason why we eat, not just because it tastes good, that's an added benefit. But we eat so God can nourish our bodies, so our bodies can do his will. Amen. So, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will concerning me and you in Christ Jesus. Notice he didn't say give thanks for everything. He says we give thanks in everything. There's a difference. You're not thankful for everything that happens to you because everything that happens to you is not good. If somebody clocked you in the head with a hammer, you would say, oh, thank you, Lord, for the cranium crack. <laughs> Nobody would say that. But what you may say is thank you, Lord, that the, that the, crack, and the, cranium to, the crack to my skull didn't kill me. Amen. And that I still have all my faculties. Amen. That's when you can say, I can be thankful in that. Amen. 
I might not be thankful that I don't have enough money to share my food. I, I don't have enough money to take my kids out to eat. But what I'm thankful for is what it's done is sat us down at the table and let us talk. Amen. Yeah. See, you find a way to be thankful. Yeah. Find a way to be thankful. Mm-hmm. Our joy, prayers, and thankfulness should not fluctuate with our circumstance of feeling. Yeah. Amen. Closing questions. How do, you, how do your actions say, God, you're thankful? Again, are you properly utilized the privilege of prayer? Number two, are you eager to follow God's specific instructions? And number three, when God answers, how do you respond? How do you respond? Is your Thanksgiving all wrapped up in turkey and dressing? Pumpkin pie, sweet potato pie, pound cake, macaroni and cheese, all uh, mashed potatoes gravy. I'm making you hungry, right? If that's what your Thanksgiving is about, then your Thanksgiving is temporary. Because you're going to consume that food, it's going to be gone, and you're going to be hungry the next day. Temporary. But see, Thanksgiving truthfully is a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle you can only live through faith in Christ. Do you have faith in Christ? Or are you so situational as a Christian? That God can never add blessings on top of the blessings on top of blessings to you. Because even though he bless you, you can't do anything with it because you don't stay attached to the blesser. Somebody can give you an 85-inch screen, flat screen TV with all the bells and whistles. Clearest screen you've ever seen. Pick up the tab and give you a full $5,000 TV. They can deliver it to your house. But you know why you'll never enjoy that, that TV? Because you don't have no electricity. And when they call you up and say, how you like that TV I sent you? I don't know. What do you mean no, no? You ain't looked at it yet? No. I ain't got no power. Power been off of here for some months. The reason why you don't get anywhere in your, your Christian walk, guess what? You ain't got no power. Because you detach yourself to the source, which is Jesus Christ. And all you did was sprinkle your life with religion. Instead of seeking God's will for your life every day. It matters where you go to church. It matters what sermons you hear. It matters what you do with them. Because you have to know what the word of God is really saying. How does this apply to me? Remember, either when I started, I told you, you either like the... Uh, Jews in the story, or you like the Samaritans. If you're saved and thankful, that would make you like the Samaritan. If you're outside of that or anything other than that, you're just an average Jew in the text that Jesus constantly told about themselves because they didn't want to follow truth. Well, you might be here today, maybe you have never given your life to Christ. Today's your moment. And maybe you have, and maybe you don't walk with him. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. This is your moment. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your life to Christ right now, whether you're online or you're here with us today, just pray the simple prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I heard you loud and clear. Lord, I no longer want to be like the Jews that were ungrateful in the story. Lord, I want to be like the Samaritans. The, spirit, the Samaritan recognized what you did for him. He came calling, and you healed him. And because he wanted more than just physical healing, he wanted a relationship with the Lord. And so he sought a relationship with the Lord. He went back to say thank you. And he was blessed with salvation. There's somebody here today who needs salvation. There's somebody online today who needs salvation. And if that speaks to your heart, just pray the simple prayer with me. They say, Lord Jesus... Here I am. Save me, Lord. Today I give you my heart and I give you my life. I may have prayed this before, but today, I don't want Thanksgiving to just be a holiday for me the rest of my life. I want Thanksgiving to be a lifestyle I live through Jesus Christ our Lord. I turn everything over to you and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. I trust you today and every day. I pray to God you would bless my life and use my life for your glory. I pray to God and I ask you to forgive me. Help me now to know better but to do better. Today I accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Fill me with the presence of your Holy Spirit that will enable me 
and empower me to live a genuine Christian life. I thank you for saving me. I love you, Lord, and I bless your name. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand to pray. I'm ready to give thanks to the Lord. Every day. 
word of worship. Amen. We honor him today. We thank God for each of you. We thank God for those of you tuning in online. And we pray that if you've been blessed by today's message, you go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org and that you would give generously here to God. But we thank those of you who've been given, and we ask you to continue to give. It blesses us here at Agape to keep the ministries of Agape going. We were able to give out Thanksgiving baskets uh, this past week. We thank each of you that participated in that. And we thank God that for 19 years, we have done that. We've been blessed to be able to make impact in our community by giving and sharing of thanks. Amen? As we celebrate 20 years of our existence as the body of believers, we have our church anniversary in January and hope that you would participate in that. We have a three-day revival coming up uh, in January. All of those events uh, will be announced uh, as coming up, and we will let you know. And so you can give. You can go to our website, and you can donate. You can donate electronically online, or you can have it mailed to the church. You can even zail it to us. You can even do that method. And so we thank you for your giving. It matters. It goes a long way here at Agape. We thank God for each of you that you choose to worship with us today, especially uh, those who are online. We thank God for you tuning in. We thank God for this message out there. You can go to our website. You can listen to this message and other messages going back at least six years. Uh, if you have the time, you can listen to them in your car, and if you don't, uh, anywhere that you can stream. You have access to that. But I want to say thank you. As your pastor, I want to say thank you for blessing and enriching my life and Sister Noah's life. We thank God for each of you. It matters that you're here with us. It matters that you have been part of our family. Once you're part of our Agape family, you're always part of our Agape family. You might not live here in this community anymore. You might not worship with us anymore, but you're still family to us. And we still pray for you each and every day. So we say have a blessed and wonderful Thanksgiving, and it not just be a holiday that you decide, hey, I'm just going to have a thankful lifestyle, all because of what Jesus Christ has done, will do, and continues to do in my life. Amen? Amen. And so before, go ahead and take your seat. Uh, the, the children ministry asked if we could do one thing before we close. Uh, the youth are coming up right now, and I think they want to share some Thanksgiving. Or they want to say what they're thankful for. If you all give us... Uh, just a, a moment of your time. <laughs> so we invite them to come down now. So Cheryl, you're gonna have to come down because it is, it is folks still online streaming trying to hear this. Uh, okay, we're in the season. Uh, everybody knows we're in the season of Thanksgiving, and our children have something that they want to give back to you in words and deeds for the Lord. So if you would just bear with us just a minute as our children tell you what they're thankful for. Right here, we will start. This is our favorite blessing. Listen, okay. Amen. Need the microphone. This is Tulsi's blessing, and she's thankful for her hair. Amen. Amen. This is her hand, and she's also thankful for her hand as well. Thank you. These are the ladies that work with the children back there in our ladies' room. Thank you, ladies, for what you do. Okay, uh, we will now have come forward. This is our older group of children. If you would come forward and share what God has put in your heart. Those of you that 
that might not know, we have had our children ministry now going on. This is our third week. God is blessing. And we thank God for our workers. We thank God for you bringing your children and lending your children and grandchildren to us. So we definitely appreciate it. Okay. This way. Y'all come this way. Okay, yeah, that's her money. She's that, if y'all know right here, she keeps telling y'all that's her money. She earned this money. Yes, she earned this one dollar deal. She did something outstanding. So since you know, us adults want to know, can we go to children's church and earn something too? <laughs> no, but we will take any of your funds that you'd like to donate to our children ministry. Yes, we will take that. We will be blessed to have that. Okay, we're going to start here. Can we, are we in there good enough, brother? Okay, so go ahead and read to us. Go ahead and tell us God has a faith in you. The peace of Christ. Yet the peace of Christ rule in your heart and be thankful. And where do we want that peace to rule in our what? In our in our heart. So he says Amen. If you Amen. want the peace of the Lord, you need to let the peace of the Lord rule also in your heart. Okay? Amen. It just doesn't come that you just thinking, okay, let it rule in your heart. Okay? Amen. Okay, these other fellows, they're gonna stand with without their faces. Um, give, th give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds. Okay. Amen. Psalms 9-1. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all his good deeds. what we had to say and what God has put on our hearts for each one of our children. These children here, they learned this within the last 30 minutes. And that lets you know God is working with us. And they're able to do things like this. So thank each and every one of you. Amen. Y'all sit on that back row. I got something to Give our children of Agape a hand. Also give, give, give thanks to uh, the women of Agape who have spearheaded this ministry. Uh, a lot of this has been shut down because of COVID uh, for many years, and we thank God after all this time that we were able to start these ministries again that we have at Agape. And so we want to thank you all for your participation, for bringing your children, and we thank God for you all that have been contributing in a way of helping educate our children and our youth. Amen? Let us stand, receive our benediction. Thank you for your patience today. Thank you for those of you tuning in online once again. And we want to say happy Thanksgiving to you. And just have a blessed and wonderful time. I hope that none of you spend time alone. That you have time with family and friends. And, and just have a joyous time. Be able to break bread over a meal. But we hope that none of you spend this time alone. If you don't have anywhere to go, please let me know. Uh, and you can spend that with us if you like. Uh, you don't have to spend time alone. We want you all to spend time with someone who loves you, and that you can enjoy a meal and break bread. Amen? Amen. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May God bless you in a mighty way. May you know that God loves you. And whatever you're lacking, God, may God not only add it to your life, that he not only meet it, but he'd exceed it. 
May he bless you in powerful and mighty ways that you do more for his kingdom with all the resources and blessings he sends your way. And may God watch between me and you as, as, before we meet again. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Everybody hug about it.